exactly the desire of our hearts this morning. Not that you would know the story of Jesus. I verily believe that there will be many. There will be many in torments in that day to come who knew the story of Jesus. But they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. They did not act upon what God had revealed about His beloved Son. The message that we bring tonight or today is a message that is received by an individual. It is not just a message about a person, but it is a message that must be received by you that you might have life. And that's why we say what a wonderful thing at the end of that hymn to be able to say, no, it's not that I just know the message, but as this brother said, that I came to the point where I could say, I believe it. I believe that Jesus died for sinners, but I believe that I was one of those sinners that He died for. I believe that He took His place on Calvary, that men might be set free. But I also believe that I was a man that needed to be set free. And believing on Jesus Christ will set you free. We want to tell you that tonight. We want to echo that word or today. That's the message of the gospel. Now, if you weren't here, and I know there's some that weren't here, I want to recap a little bit about what we've had the last couple of days. We saw on Friday evening... We saw a man, not unlike you if you don't know the Lord Jesus, that was condemned to death. This man had no hope. This man had been sentenced to die. And we saw on Friday evening that this man crucified beside the Lord Jesus on one of those three crosses. This man turned to the Lord Jesus at the last moment of his life. And he said to the other man that was with him, he says, I want to tell you about this center cross. I want to tell you about this man on that cross. He has done nothing amiss. But you and I, we've received the due reward of our deeds. We've lived a life of sin. And we talked Friday evening of choices, of decisions, and of consequences. Eternal consequences. Not just consequences that affect man and time, although they do. Oh, we say to young people, Satan is a terrible taskmaster. He's a terrible one to serve. I saw a sign in southwestern Virginia just a couple of days ago. Many of you, especially young people, will be aware of the makeover artist. And how they take someone who is perhaps in the eyes of the world just plain, and they make he or she quite glamorous. The news was a bit different on this. It was an illustration of the drug culture and the makeover of four young people. And it was desperate to see the tools, the instruments that Satan uses to keep boys and girls and men and women from coming to the Savior. That man, Friday evening we looked at, he heard from the lips of the Lord Jesus himself, These words, today, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now I want to tell you something tonight. It isn't an accident and it it isn't a chance that you happen to be in this building today where the Lord Jesus presents himself in the way of the gospel. I don't believe in a God of chance. I don't believe in luck and these things that people happenstance. It just happens that way. But I verily believe that God works in such a way 
that men and women and boys and girls hear the news of the gospel. And you become accountable for what you've heard. A day of accounting, a day of reckoning comes. Now I want to ask you as we begin this meeting, were today, were you ushered out into eternity? I know you don't think that will happen. You see, the enemy of our souls makes us think that in fact those things happen to other people. But what if today? What if leaving here today on 495 or one of the roads around here, what if suddenly you were taken into eternity? Where would you go? You see, the Lord wants you to face that today. Am I saved? Am I saved by the grace of God today? That's what this message is about. That man that we talked about On Friday night, he came in those last few moments of his life to realize the wonderful blessing of belonging to Jesus. Then we talked last night. We talked about an area last night that many people don't stop and think of. When they think of the Lord Jesus, they think of a man that was mutilated and beaten and crowned with thorns and put upon a cross and that's the last thought they have of him. That's not what Scripture teaches me. It is not today a man that is crowned with crown of thorns. It is not the agony of Calvary that we see today when we speak of our Lord Jesus. But we speak today of a man that God has highly exalted. He has given him a name which is above every name. And do you know what God has declared? He has declared of His Son Jesus that every knee is going to bow to Him. Every knee. Are you part of mankind? You say, well, of course I am. Then I can tell you something. You will have an appointment. You will bow here by grace. Or you will bow there and not by choice. God has highly exalted His Son. We we sang this morning in the meeting of how this blessed one glorified His God in going to Calvary, in giving His life. Many times people only know one side of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. The passion of the Christ was mentioned the other night. I can tell you something. I never saw it. But I know this. That there's one side generally that is presented. And that is the side that shows me what man did to the Savior. There's another side. There's another side to the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. What man did to the Savior, do you know what it shows? It seals the guilt of man. That they took the Son of God and they nailed Him to a cross. They treated Him awful. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm not saved because of what men did to the Savior. There's not anyone in this room who is saved tonight because of what men did to the Savior. I'm saved because God judged Him in my place. He became my substitute. He stood where I couldn't stand. He bore what I couldn't bear. In his own body on the tree. And he today is the exalted man. He's the man of glory. He's the one that speaks this day from the presence of God to men and women on this earth. And he points back to his work. He points back to Calvary. And he says, I'm going to give you another opportunity. I died for you. I gave my life's blood that you might have life. And now I present myself. He says, I reach down. Will you take my offer? Will you take me? This is the day of grace. 
the brother mentioned relatively few. We saw last night the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. You think of that. Satan saying to young men and young women, and I especially speak to young men and young women, because I know many young people who came to Christ. I know fewer in their 20s. I know fewer than that in their 30s. I can tell you that I know of one man who was almost 90. But he's the only one I know of. In my 60 years here, I never knew anybody else saved at that late age. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, when the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. What does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. That means that sin hardens man's heart. Sin hardens the heart of man. Do you know what else hardens the heart of man? Hearing the gospel. Hearing the presentation of Christ and not responding. Hearing and not coming. Hearing and not doing. And pretty soon, I, I, at least I think it's like those who lived in the days of Noah. When men lived and went about life just as though there was never going to be a flood. Don't you think that they probably thought that Noah was one of the most ridiculous men in the world? Come on now, you're telling me there's going to be a flood and you're out here building a boat and we've never seen rain. We've never seen rain. And you're talking about judgment. And for 120 years, Noah preached to man. Do you know how many were saved? Just Noah and his sons and their wives. That's all. Do you know what finally happened? The day came... The day came when this world heard a storm. You think they might have done that? You think they may have ran to the boat? Do you think they may have gone and said, you know, there must be something too. Noah! Noah! But God had closed the door. And I'll tell you something. I believe that we live in the last days. I believe that we live in those days just prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus for His own. We're going to look at that in a minute. I'm going to tell you, you hear the gospel of the grace of God today and the church is taken out of this scene. I would never want to be in your place. I was thinking that today we would look at His coming. And I just thought of this in the morning meeting, and I'm just going to turn you to it. This is from the book of 1 Corinthians. If you have a Bible, you turn to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's just a wonderful little reminder for those of us that belong to Him, but for you if you don't, this is verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread, as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, your translation probably has the word show. You know there's a better translation that has this word. Announce. You do announce the Lord's death. But don't stop there. You do announce His death till he come. He's coming again. That's the wonderful news. We had the man who suffered in the glory of his work. The man that is in the glory. Now we have this blessed one who's coming again. That's the wonderful news of the gospel. Uh, John could say this 
Uh, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Know where that was? That wasn't in heaven. It's the cross. When the Lord Jesus is gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go, he says, I will come again. If I go away, I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself. That where I am, listen to what he says. This is the Savior speaking. That where I am, there ye may be also. Are you going to be there? Do you know who's going to be there? I'll tell you. All of those. And I don't want to minimize when I say all. Because the book of Revelation tells me that there are going to be those surrounding Him from every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. There are going to be myriads in the glory that surround that blessed man. And the great question is, are you going to have your place there? Are you going to be with Him? He offers again and again in the day of grace. He offers His hand. He offers His work. Now, I want you to turn to verses, and you might look at these verses And if you're familiar with the Word of God, this is 1 Thessalonians 4. You might say, well, these are verses for believers. Well, that's true. The Bible is for believers. The Bible is for believers. But I want to tell you something. The Bible is also what makes unbelievers believers. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God that He speaks through. So often these verses are preached on at funerals. You see, so often the verses that I quoted from John are spoken of at funeral services. This is 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Now listen to what God says. Wouldn't you be in a fix if in fact we were speaking to you about a God that couldn't communicate with you? If we were speaking to you about a God that couldn't cause something to be said or written that you would understand it. It's not the God that we belong to. He is able to communicate. He has shown man his eternal deity in the very creation of the world that we live in. But I'll tell you, his heart is revealed in the cross of the Lord Jesus. Now here he says, I would not have you to be ignorant. Isn't that wonderful? There's two kinds of ignorance. You always remember this. There's an ignorance of a man that sets his neck and says, I don't want to know about that. That's one kind of ignorance. But there's another kind of ignorance whereby someone needs to know what he or she has never heard before. Ah, that's an ignorance that the Lord Jesus would deal with. I would not have you to be ignorant. And then he says, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. My, look at this. That ye sorrow not. Some had died. They had died. They had left this world. Now we know from other verses that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. We know that. We have a house eternal in the heavens, the scripture would say. But here are those, he says, that, have, uh, that are asleep in Jesus. He says that ye sorrow not, even as others, which what? Have no hope. This is why I say these are verses just as much for the unbeliever to hear as they are for the believer. You see, the world is separated right in this verse. I see some who have hope and I see others that have no hope. If we were to turn back to the book of Ephesians, we would hear that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And then he says, wherefore remember... That ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Here's that same word. Having 
no hope. Having no hope and without God in this world. Awful condition. Awful condition. Here's one. Others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so also them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. How did any of us in this room get saved? There was once a Philippian jailer. And he was given the responsibility of taking care of this man Paul. After he had beaten him and thrust him into the inner prison. And those familiar with this story will remember that there was a great earthquake. It was the strangest earthquake the world had ever seen. The building didn't fall down, but the doors all opened. The chains all come off the hands of the men and the feet of the men that were there. But none of the men that were there escaped. And that man, that man was so taken aback. He was ready to take his life. But he saw that the prisoners were all there. And he came in, in front of the Apostle Paul, and he said, what must I do to be saved? That's a good question. That's a wonderful question for anybody to ask. I was 18, 17 years old when I first asked that same question. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Now be careful when someone tells you believe. They may tell you about some prophet that died and is still dead and his bones are still with us. They may tell you about the works of man. They may tell you to go to Sunday school and do good things and you're going to be all right. It's not, in fact, just believing, but it's what you believe. It's who you believe in. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the work that He has completed. Believe in Him. Put your faith and trust in that person. Receive Him into your heart. And we can tell you, you will be saved today. Another verse from Romans says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. I love to say, are you a whosoever? Is that you? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. This, he says, we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now let's stop there. The word of the Lord. My word doesn't mean much. I'm just like you. I'm a mortal. I'm just a man. But the word of the Lord is the word that is established forever in heaven. Thy word, O Lord, is forever established, the psalmist could say. So, you know, it isn't what I say. It isn't what this brother says or this brother. But it's what the Word of God says. And the Word of God assures us that when men or women put their faith and trust in Him, they shall be saved. Which we say unto you by the Word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, look at that, under the coming, under the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself, the Lord Himself, shall descend from heaven with a shout. I hear people looking for signs. You can see all kinds of signs in the world that we live in. I don't think that I would have to prove to you that this is a wicked world. But I'm not looking for a sign. I'm listening for a voice. I'm listening for the shout. I'm listening for these words here. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. The dead in Christ shall what? They shall rise first. That isn't just a hope. That is the fact of what God says is going to happen when He sends His Son back for His own. The dead in Christ are going to rise. And then we which are alive and remain, we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I want to ask you, what's your hope? 
Is your hope center in this world? Is your hope center in the stability of man? What he's able to do? If it does, I can tell you, you've been disappointed. No disappointment like you will know. But there's nothing here. The great insurance company, I think, I can't remember which one of it was, but they used to say, solid as a rock. Only to find out that they had problems in their investments and what they thought was solid was not solid at all. And pretty soon it was gone. And we live in the wake of Enron and all these people who were looking and depending upon all of this that a company would be able to give. Boom, just like that it was gone. Just like that it was gone. Listen, there's nothing here. There's nothing abiding here. We want to tell you that. He says, to meet the Lord in the air. We're in 1 Thessalonians 4, if you have a Bible. To meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And he says to believers, you comfort one another. You say, there may be the occasion when you're with someone who has lost a loved one. God forbid that a believer should say, I don't have anything to say. Comfort one another with these words. Our help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. We have His Word. Now the great question in the Gospel meeting this morning is where do you stand in relation to Him? Is He your Savior? He can be. He wants to be. He invites you, we said last evening, He takes for a young man, a young woman, He gives purpose, He gives direction, He gives hope, He gives all of those things that men and women and boys or girls are turning everywhere in the world looking for it. And they have one thing in common. They all leave disappointed. They can't find anything that will answer the questions they have even as to time. Let alone eternity. Now, I know our time is just about gone, but I want to turn you over to the second book of Thessalonians. And I just want to leave some verses with you speaking to those when you're not safe. And you're thinking of the stability of this world. And you've heard me say that Jesus is coming. He's coming for his own. Do you have any idea what kind of a world you're going to be left in? Have any idea? 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Listen to what he does. He opposes, and he exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Look at this. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth. You look in the margin and you'll see there, it's what hindereth. What withholdeth that he might be revealed? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. I'm going to tell you what those verses mean. Those verses are a direct reference to the Spirit of God. You may live in a world where you think good politics is what is keeping peace in this world that we live in. You may look at the election the other day. I don't know whether it went the way you wanted it to or not. But you may be talking about men and politics that are able to bring peace in this world. I'll tell you what is withholding. The Spirit of God is the one that is withholding in this world that we live in. He lives in the church. He lives in the hearts of believers. 
And the day is coming when he's going to be taken up. Woe be to those that are left here. Woe be to that young man, that young woman, that family that has said no to Christ. And the church is taken up. And you are left here. He says, then shall that wicked one be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power. You may have thought of power in the apostles. You may have thought of power in the disciples. You may have thought of power at the beginning of the church age that we live in. God's word tells me that power is going to be evident at the end of the church age. What does it say is going to happen? There's going to be power and there's going to be signs. Oh, but this is something different. It's not just wonders. It's lying wonders. There's going to be a man that is going to be here upon this earth and the world is going to flock after him. They've rejected the Savior. They're going to go after this man. You will be. One of them. Listen what it says. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because. Because what? Because they receive not the love of the truth. That what? Read that. Read it. You read it for yourself. That they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause. For this cause. God shall send them strong delusion. That they should believe a lie. That's the world you're headed for. That's the world. If you don't know Jesus, you're headed for this world. That you would believe a lie. And what does God say? That they might all be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Oh, I tell you, there's no future for this world. There's no future for the man of this world. Our future lies in the coming one. It lies in the man of Calvary. It lies in the one that has taken our place in death. This is the day of grace. We're still here. Gospel preachers can still preach the gospel. We can still say, come to Jesus. But you know what we can never do? We can never bring you. You must come. You must come. You must personally, individually, weigh what God has revealed And you must. Billy Graham's program used to be called the hour of decision. You must, yourself, examine, as Steve set before us, this one, and then what we would trust. That you would say, you know, I've had enough of this life. I've had enough of what this world has to offer. And I would like to give my life to Jesus. We want to help you if you would like that. I'd like to sit down with you and pray with you, open the scripture with you again. Others here would. But we shift the weight, the burden, the responsibility from off our shoulders onto yours. Will you Also, be his disciple. That's what the man of John 9 said. And we ask you that tonight. Will you be a follower of Jesus? Will you come to him? We're going to sing a hymn in closing. And we're going to tell you that there's a lot of us here that are going to be standing over here. And we'd like to talk to you. And if today has been the hour of decision for you, We want to ask you to let it be known. It's just as I am. It's 2.40.
six. No, I look in the back. What is it? 226. You see, this is the way we come. When this brother mentioned that at 18, he came to the Lord Jesus, he didn't come by fixing himself up and dressing himself up and sprucing himself up. He didn't do that. He came just as he was. That's the way Steve came. I grew up with Steve. This is the way my wife came. This is the way, this is the way we all came. Just as we were without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. And that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. 226. somebody here tonight or this morning that you would like to make a decision for Jesus today. Raise your hand if you would. Step out. 
Don't stay where you are. Come to him. We say again before we pray, maybe you just have a question. We'd like to talk with you. We'd like to pray with you. But the decision has to be yours. Lord Jesus, we thank Thee. Oh, blessed Lord, we thank Thee that Thou art ready, willing, and able to save. Thou art able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by Thee. We commit this word to Thee today. We thank Thee for Your help. Oh, Lord, we thank Thee for the activity and the work of the Holy Spirit. We thank Thee for Your promise that it will not return void. Lord, if Thou art speaking to one, give them, we pray. Do not even consider the one sitting beside them, but, Lord Jesus, to consider their own eternal destiny. We ask your help in speaking with them. Thank thee for the brethren here, the brothers and sisters. We ask your blessing, your encouragement, your help for them. And now we commit this meeting and its results to thee, Lord Jesus. We give you thanks in your worthy, precious name, O Lord. Amen. Amen.